behold, the sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Blessed are your eyes. For they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them. And to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Good morning and welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ here in Ocala, Florida. We welcome you to our online worship services here in the second week of July. I've lived about three-fourths of my life in urban, suburban communities, Phoenix, uh, 
Boston, Denver, Fort Lauderdale, and here. One quarter of my life in rural communities. I learned to drive a John Deere, I learned to drive a car by learning first how to drive a John Deere tractor, back and forth cultivating corn. Between college and seminary, <clears throat> back on a John Deere cultivating corn, cotton, soybeans, and spraying poison on the soybeans for nematodes. Years later, living on a farm working with autistic children, I raised a small herd of beef cattle. I named one of my calves Isaac, and if you know the story of Isaac, you'll know why he got that name. I named another one of my calves Betty Davis, because she had such pretty Betty Davis eyes. But back in seminary, I got into farming, call it farming, because I felt that I had earned my stripes on real sure enough farms in earlier years. But my seminary farming started out as more intimate, small-scale gardening which turned into truck farming. <clears throat> to quote the opening of my favorite short story, The Ransom of Red Chief by O. Henry, it seemed like a good thing, but wait till you hear. If you haven't read that story, I'll tell you what, I'll post a link to the short story, The Ransom of Red Chief, in my newsletter article later this week, and you can download it and read it yourself, okay? So, there were four of us involved in this garden. Dr. Ronald Williams, professor of theology. Dr. Roy Reed, liturgy and church music. Dr. Robert Tannehill, professor of New Testament. And Dr. Van Bogard Dunn, dean and professor of New Testament. And I figure that they hauled me into the project because I drove a 1960 International Harvester truck, which would, as you will see, turn out to be a good thing, but wait till you hear. <clears throat> we planted, we planted 30 hills of corn, 10 eggplant, 30 of tomatoes, 20 of cherry tomatoes, 20 of squash, 30 of green beans, butter beans, and snap peas each, 30 of carrots, 20 of bell peppers, 10 of beets, 20 cucumber, 5 watermelon, 3 of wasabi, 20 okra, and 30, get this, 30 of zucchini. That's 30 hills of zucchini. And we planted that much because we'd figure, we figured we'd lose like half of it, you know. So anyway, we, we'd gather for planting and fertilizing and watering and tilling. Rabbits came after our tomatoes, so we put up chicken wire fence around the entire garden. And you know what, for all of our efforts, the Roman goddess Pomona, goddess of agriculture, smiled on us. Absolutely every plant germinated and began growing so fast you could swear that you could hear the earth groan as the plants pulled food from the earth. In the fourth week, Ron, Roy, and the dean took off on vacation, leaving Bob Tannehill and me with the garden. Now Bob, gentleman of grace and understanding as he was, Bob came close to cussing all three of those guys for leaving us with the garden. Because in week six, all hell broke loose. Every plant produced with a vengeance. We filled our, pantry, our pantries instantly 
ours and our families, and the entire seminary, students, faculty, and administration. We put a sign out by the road that says, free vegetables, come take what you want, please come take it. But all of those efforts, they just scraped the problem. Every day, every day, Sundays included, we trucked four loads, remember the International Harvester truck? We trucked four loads of food to town, to the town square and gave it away. People offered to give us money, but we said, no, please take it, take it, please invite your friends, we'll be back in two hours. Zucchini, most of them were the size of watermelons. My mother pretended not to be home when I pulled up in the driveway with zucchinis spilling over the top of the bed of the truck. When Roy and Ron and the dean returned from vacation, we met them with cold daggered stares. I haven't planted a garden since. But <clears throat> the pearl of great treasure was the time that I got to spend with Bob Tannehill, New Testament professor. Lucky to have Bob all by myself to dig into the garden, even as we dug into the Gospels. Bob was so very generous in helping me learn things that have been the most useful tools of my, of my ministry. I've used the tools that Bob gave me every single Sunday preparing sermons for the past 41 years. Bob wrote the very first volume devoted specifically to understanding the Gospels as metaphorical, mythical language long before John Shelby Spong and, and uh, Sally McFaig. The sword of his mouth was Bob's brilliant essay that opened the door for postmodern biblical research and exposition. If you haven't figured it out by now, I am a Bob Tannehill fan. Moving up and down the rows, silently hoeing, digging, picking. Out of the blue, Bob would unleash a tidal wave. Nothing we're doing made this happen, Hal. We're caretakers. And then back to hoeing. Parishes are gardens. Sometimes you have to provide a stake for tomatoes to grow as well as they can. He'd unroll metaphor after metaphor, symbol after symbol. And sometimes I wouldn't know when he was talking garden or church parish or world. On he'd go. How have you thought of the paradox that everyone who deals in creativity and beauty knows that if you don't work hard and if they don't work hard in their gardens, that they're just going to have a tangled mess. But mess. Bob had a had a joke. You know the one about the minister who stopped on his morning walk to talk with the neighbors. Uh, who was working in his garden, how you know that story? The neighbor was weeding and watering, and the minister couldn't resist a moment of theological reflection. Isn't it wonderful, he gushed, what human beings and God can do together? A sweaty man working in the garden looked up and said, Sure is, Reverend. You should have seen this garden when God was doing it all by God's self. Which was to say, no me, no Bob, no garden. But the garden was an extravagant gift, certainly. But you've got to unwrap gifts, right? A man went out to plant, scattering seed everywhere. Some never sprouted, birds got to it first, or it landed on soil too rocky for roots. Some seed that did germinate got choked off by weeds. Some couldn't get enough sun. 
but some fell on good earth with just the right amount of light and rain and yielded 30, 60, 100 fold. And Jesus explains, the seed is the word of God. Not everyone who hears it will take it in, but if we do, what can happen to us is beyond dreaming. Even if, for me and Bob, our garden was a living nightmare. Do you get this story? Hmm? Do you? Am I rocky soil? Do you choke off the word of God, the voice of God, like thorns? Hmm. Maybe we'd better pile on more compost, weed more diligently, fence out rabbits, fertilize, till, the, till with greater and grimmer determination, faster and faster. But too much of this sort of thing turns the parable into a spiritual work ethic, which is not Jesus' point. In Jesus' day, farming was often a hit-or-miss operation. You tossed seeds indiscriminately, and you hoped for the best. And the average was about 10% yield. So when Jesus says that his fictional farmer got 100% yield, real farmers would have laughed in his face for making an agricultural promise that nobody could keep. But through forceful and imaginative language, that's Bob's term, forceful and imaginative language, Jesus shared that God wants that kind of yield in our lives, making this a parable about a God who can and will make much more of our efforts than is either expected or proportionate. Our garden turned out proof positive in the gardening world. <laughs> Boy, did it ever. And how much more so in the course of human events. God, which is to say love, God, love, same thing, asks us to come to terms with gardening through our love cultivating what has already been planted among us, within us, and tending it every day, day by day. Consulting our scriptures, yes. Worshiping each week within our community of faith. Asking for what we need in daily prayer. Giving thanks to God for all we have and all that we are bringing the wisdom of Christ to our lives in small and large things, never getting out of daily touching distance of real human suffering, putting ourselves in the way of loveliness every day, letting ourselves fully enjoy the pleasure of the simplest things and perhaps the most difficult Disciplining ourselves to believe that God, love, is passionate about us and desires our good for all of our gardening tasks. And yes, this again may be the most difficult one. After a while, we'll begin to feel a certain devotion to our tasks a need to discipline ourselves in small things that will become a blessed routine without which we will feel odd at sea, hmm? a little off kilter. Gradually, this simple daily discipline becomes deep passion and chores. Chores aren't work. Chores are gifts. We will pay attention differently to hear differently, care differently. Interests and priorities shift. 
Judging others takes on refined compassion with less narrow-mindedness, less self-interestedness, with more concern for people who are lacking and vulnerable and in danger. We become less obsessed with our image and abilities and more settled and self-accepting, more open to others, less self-protective, more able to forgive and to be forgiven, more able to relinquish securities and our firmly held but rarely thought through options, more acutely aware of the world's pain, more creative in making a difference even in the smallest of ways, more able to enjoy, more gratefully able to give and to receive pleasure. And season on season, crop after crop, we experience the paradox that everyone who deals in creativity and beauty knows. The harvest we will have become is not solely of our own making, but is an extraordinary gift full of mercy and mystery. And when others and when others start noticing our more centered lives, when, when people are attracted to God because of our love, when someone inquires about our gardening secrets and our growing tips, we will respond not in false modesty, but in all truth. We did not make ourselves loving and just alone. We did not do it by our own wisdom and skill alone. We did not do it just as a result of our families. It was not our effort alone that produced a reconciliation or a compromise in our circle of friends and even with our enemies. It was not just our organizing skill that prompted, say, our company to act more fairly with our workers or our politicians to work more diligently for the good of all. We will live gratefully in the great wonderment of the hundredfold yield that in God's spirit it was all just as Jesus predicted so long ago. We will have become intimately persuaded that life is not about achievement, acquisition, and productivity, not about earning God's, our own, or other people's, or some free-form cosmic approval, not a protracted struggle to get the love we never got and wish we had, and that would never be enough for us anyway, but that life is about love, Love already given and available in infinite supply about gifts bestowed and received, mercy showered down and soaked up and blessings all around. <clears throat> we may water and plant, but God makes things mature, including us, including justice, including happiness, including desire. God wants to give us this unbelievable yield, and maybe it's hard to accept being the recipient of such generosity, hard to credit that God could be so enamored with us, but such is Christ's message. And we can live as if we know it to be true in a daily discipline of refusing the internal voices that tell us that it can't be that way. If we even get that far, even if all we have is desire, God's creative commitment to us will make us joyful Grateful cultivators of the gardens God has given us to tend. Our souls, our bodies, 
our families, the towns of which we are citizens, the nation and the world for which we bear responsibility, and the church wherein we learn about and celebrate the beauty of God's work. And we will bear fruit. 30, 60, a hundredfold. As you return to the heat of this day, the heat of this Florida Sunday, summer, go gladly. Trust God to produce this beauty, to produce it whether you're watering your garden or digging up carrots. Love will bless you with extravagant yields, just as your deed deeds flow from your desire with your sighs too deep for words. Amen. Let us pray. God of all seasons, of all moods, of all people, of each other, may we be lifted into a new mood to be part of a new way of being in the world. Touch us again that we will know we are accepted, that we are affirmed and people of worth, and that we are generously blessed. We lament that there are those who believe there can be reconciliation without justice, justice without understanding, understanding without standing in the shoes of others, standing without being still. May we be reminded that we can use our influence, that we can raise our voices, that we can flood our government's galleries, that we can attend parent-teacher interviews, send email, voicemail, letters to the editor, gather in the streets, in bank foyers, and in, church, and in churches when it is safe. That we can rise up in power on behalf of all those who live in the streets in back alleys, in gutters, that we can rise up on behalf of all we love and all that keeps us alive. This day we also take time to look around, to look beyond ourselves, beyond words and roles, beyond past hurts and future worries, to embrace those who are hurting, those who suffer the erosions of time or the inflictions of illness, those who struggle to break free from unhealthy patterns of behavior or to heal crippled relationships. May we be prompted to be more expansive and more inclusive 
as we accept our responsibility to make God's reign visible through gracious generosity. This is our prayer. Amen. Let us pray. God, source of life and creativity in a universe so vast, may we sustain a good sense of this presentness and a good sense of worth in ourselves. When time and events and people go by so fast, may we know the power in pausing and in pausing, find our life renewed. At this time and in this sacred place, we remember our own country, its beaches, its forests, its plains and its mountains, its wilderness and its cities, its unique and marvelous ecology, its people, who have been here forever. 
and it's people who have come here in more recent times. In our day-to-day -day living beyond this time of celebration, may we be surrounded with a good spirit of life and vitality, of healing and restoration, of acceptance and quietness of mind. May we be a part of a good spirit in the world where life and vitality overcome the powers of destructiveness and blandness. May today be the day that we, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and all others become sojourners together on the pathways of goodwill, service, compassion, and justice. And may our living be enlarged by the ageless truths found within all traditions and among all people. This is our prayer. Amen.